Anyway, I have been asked to talk about the relevance of the teachings of Guru Granth Sahib and the living in the modern world. I have then thought, what would, what is modern world and the state of the modern world? When I thought about it, I thought it is a state in which there is all dismay on every front. There is no hope at the moment. Now, science and technology is the chief pivot of the modern world. And science theoretically has arrived at the end of its tether. It can't go on further according to what it's evolved it would be its dictum. It won by objectivity. And science is absolutely objective. Now when they went down into the atom and reached the subatomic particles, it shuddered for three reasons. Reason number one, the subatomic particles were really not matter, and then to call them particles is absurd. Second, when the scientists thought or presumed that it, this particle is moving in a straight line, it could be proved scientifically that it moves in a straight line. If you believe that it moves in a wave, it could equally well be proved that it moves as a wave. In other words, it wasn't the objective situation that was determined. It was the subjective thought that was imposed, which determined how it flows, how it moves. Now, that was the end of its objectivity. And it shuddered now. The second thing that happened, another thing that happened is that science having become totally uncertain about its objectivity, now thought, what will be the research modality for subjectivity? And it has nothing in hand. It has developed methods of exploring the objective world, the material world, but no method for going into the interior world. So I thought maybe our psychology helps us. And Western psychology has already burnt its books. Western psychology starts with the science of psyche, which contained both the soul and the mind. And pretty soon, it began to have the, the ambition of becoming a, an exact science. So it thought, let the soul go to the padre, let the priest take care of it, we we'll concern ourselves only with mind. Then to study mind, there was only one method available, and that was introspection. You go in and find out what is happening in your mind. And they thought that was very unreliable. Your uh, subjectivity is very sub different from mine. How can we compare the two? So they thought, let's give up mind and concentrate on behavior. So psychology had become the science of behavior. That is the Western psychology. And I went to, for the first time I went to Scotland, I met a behavioral scientist. And I asked him, what are your dictums? He told me, every behavior is learnt behavior. I said, well, I'm so sorry. I never learnt how to cough. I never learnt how to blink. I never learned how to yawn. I never learned how to cry. I never learned how to smile. All these are my behaviors. None of them is learned. I said, no, no, we are talking about the learned behavior only. I said, then where do you draw the line between the learned and the unlearned? That was the, the a difficult speech. Second, I thought, what is the second symptom? You see, every behavior is measurable. I said, I agree. But what does that measurement tell you? Supposing I smile, and you can measure the breadth of my lips, what does it tell you? Whether I smile out of recognition, or out of pleasure, or out of 
embarrassment or out of disdain, what, what, what does that smile indicate? Measurement has no meaning. You know, that is where the Western psychology today is and is no help. And in fact, if you take up a textbook of psychology, there will be no, not a word about consciousness, which really is behind everything. So they, they were totally disarrayed. So it could give no aid to the Western psychology. So that was the first great dismay of science. The second is, science has so far learned only to test what, is, what are called testable hypotheses. A hypothesis that can be tested through its own styles of measurement and styles of uh, uh, assessment. Now there are areas, very important areas in human life which, which are not testable. For instance, is there a God? Okay. Or everything in spirituality can't be tested. Everything in aesthetics, what is beautiful, why it attracts, we, we can't test it. Similarly for morals, what is good, how can you test it? There are no scientific tests in these important areas. And that was the second dismay of science and technology. The third thing that happened is socially it has made the coming generations sterile. What is it doing? If you look at your own um, little kids, you would know they're either on the TV or they're on the computer or if they're scientists, they're in the labs. Totally isolated from the surroundings. That asociality is going to be a pattern. I'm reminded, I was in uh, New Delhi, the All India Institute, I barely joined there, when there was the problem of cannabis here in this country. And a high power committee from here went to India because they thought in India there was a lot of cannabis and many people and sadhus took cannabis and so we would be able to study something there or at least get to know how best to go about it. And I was invited to their seminar and asked to talk about history of cannabis. And there wasn't a word in any scientific journal about history of cannabis. So I went somehow to the National Archives of India and they told me there was a report by government of India in 1898 when a hemp commission was appointed and they had given the report. I thought it must be a report of five, six pages. There is a report. It was a 340 pages report. And I was amazed. I read through it, made notes of it, and then presented that to the seminar. And they were astonished. They thought I knew everything about cannabis. So they wanted me to come here. I don't know the word. Can you explain me what it is? Cannabis is bhang. Bhangi po. Marijuana. Sorry, the name was the word. So they asked me to come here. They said, if you come with us, we'll give you your green card straight away. I said, no, nothing doing, I'm not coming. Then two days later, they came to our house. And they said, we ensure you citizenship within three months. Come with us. I'm sorry, I'm not coming. And they, in fact, were surprised that a man says, I'm not coming. My wife said, why don't you go? I said, if I go there, the whole of my next, the remaining part of my life, I'd be sitting in one cabin doing research on cannabis. <laughs> and that is intolerable to be here. I teach boys. I, I look after patients. It's a very lively style of life. Why can, how can I barter this for that? For a, for a few bucks. That was, that is, here you find that is a rat race. Go ahead. Even if you are sitting in the laboratory, it doesn't matter. Make money. Uh, that, that is a very, very different attitude. Now, another thing that is, that 
the technology has done is to provide clever tools to criminals. Now, at the moment, if you look at it, the criminals are ahead of the police in any country in the equipment they have. And therefore, the police is at loggerheads everywhere. So socially, the science and technology have also given us dismay. We are disappointed. Morally, Can science you has a, a little bit more on clever tools to criminals. So I don't. Oh. You do you look at your movies. And the movies will tell you how the okay. criminals are uh, ahead of the police. Well, it doesn't require any, okay. any examples. Like the examples are the road. Now, we are talking about morality. Science has nothing to say about morality. Take any book of science, there won't be a word about morality. Morals is completely taboo for science. But it has in inflamed greed and jealousy. Technology is done. Every day new instruments come. I'm sure about the device that you carry on your hands and put on your clothes. And while you are walking or while you are driving or while you are, even while you are sleeping possibly. Now, what has happened to us? It has really inflamed our jealousies. If your instrument is better than mine, then I say, I, I should also buy that. That kind of incipient jealousy and then greed also, because technology makes things easier to earn, and therefore technology breeds greed. So uh, this greed and jealousy are two very important uh, disvalues of morality, which technology has generated. And then within science, you know there have been many, many moral scams, wrong findings of research, stolen research. I'm reminded I was in, um, last, no, in uh, Scotland once, in Edinburgh. And uh, one of the scientists there who was making a study on sleep patterns asked one of his uh, statisticians to analyze the data and see if his hypothesis is void or his hypothesis is approved. <coughs> so the statisticians had applied the statistics and this hypothesis is not proved. He said, no, no, nonsense, this can't be. So he asked another uh, statistician <coughs> to see how this hypothesis can be proved statistically. And he devised the statistical method by means of which it would be proved statistically. Now, such uh, things are happening in science. Again, somebody told me that there are studies now in which, which say, if you drink a little wine every day, it uh, cleans your blood vessels and so you have lesser heart attack. I heard this and thought for a while. I said, let's do two things. One, let's make a, an expecto uh, research and find out over the last 10 or 12 years, all those who have heart disease, how many of them were drinking or how many were not drinking? And you would find that drinkers had more heart disease than the others, number one. Number two, find out if these doctors who have produced these